I want to shift gears today. Let's pray. Father, as we get into the word, I ask you to put me on as your microphone. I ask you to anoint our ears to hear the word of God. Let us, Lord, your kingdom is a spiritual one. And we pray we would listen with our spiritual ears and see with our spiritual eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to shift gears today. And um, I was preaching on the kingdom for the last four weeks. And where I was at a place where I actually finished the second message, which took three weeks of that, and I was either going to start another message on the kingdom or shift gears. And as I prayed about it, and I saw some current events unfolding in our culture, I felt like I was going to shift gears, and for the next three or four weeks, I'm going to minister a series called Christ, Culture, and the Church. Christ, Culture, and the Church. And we're going to study the culture, we're going to study the church, and realize it is the church's job to build the bridge between a culture that is lost and a Christ that saves. It's our job as the church to link those two together. Now, after, let's see here. Let's talk about culture for a minute. I know many people, especially if, if, if you were raised in the faith, if you have a, a what we would call you know, Midwestern values, uh, which used to be American values. Um, if, if you have kind of a, 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 a Judeo-Christian outlook on life, you would be, look and listen to our news reports and be very discouraged and distraught about what you hear, as am I. Sometimes people say, Pastor, you need to address these things more, and, and I need to address everything more. I mean, if you haven't noticed, the Bible goes from Genesis to Revelation. There's a lot of stuff I don't get to preach just because I only get to see you so many times a year, you know. Well, the other thing is sometimes, and truth be told, especially with some of the current issues, I do get so angry, um, and I have to be careful because I don't ever want to say something in the pulpit I don't mean. Amen. And, and I, I do have some righteous anger and some righteous indignation within me about some of these things today. And so I will do my best to control how I say it, and, and, and if I will um, not go too far in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. But you see, we grew up, and some of you who are a little bit older, you even grew up when the Bible was a textbook in school. Some of you learned to read and write using the Bible and King James English at that as your text. And you look from that to where we are today, it's a huge difference in our culture. And it's very shocking, and, and sometimes it almost has a paralyzing effect on the church because we're so upset about what we see in the news that we get negative and down and out and depressed. And as I'm preaching today, you know, I packed my, my Brazil bag last night. And any time I go to a, a foreign nation, the third world nation, I always pack something that goes with me everywhere. It's simply a flashlight. Because over there, the power goes out a lot. And one thing you've learned is when you shine a flashlight in the darkness, you can see. And the only way you can drive out darkness is not by yelling at the darkness or telling the darkness how dark it is. The way we drive out darkness is simply by shining the light. Okay? And I'm thinking, as I was researching and, and, and such, if we look at cultures around the world and over the history of humanity, culture almost more often than not around the history of the world is absolutely always been diametrically opposed to Judeo-Christian values. Uh, I want, I want to th talk about India for just a moment. And this happened in India for centuries. And it was the practice of city, S-I-T-I. And bottom line is, um, we'll use Andrew and I as an example, but if... I died 
before Andrea. Um, the funeral was going to be, I would be on a raised table to be cremated. But the, the caveat to that is Andrea, alive, would be tied to my body and strapped down to my body. And if you got married in India and your husband died before you did, you would have to burn when he burned, only you would burn alive. That was called Siti. That happened for century after century after century. And it was a missionary, William Carey, who we call the father of modern missions. And William Carey began to preach Jesus Christ over there in the 1800s, okay? And as he was preaching Jesus, he was turning the light on. You know, he, went, he had to preach for seven years before we got his first convert, okay? I tell you, I thought, I thought we had it bad coming to Cloverdale. It took us a while to get started, too. But he, he preached seven years, didn't have a single convert. His son died. <laughs> his wife eventually died. And eventually, though, he began to have effectiveness he found out his gift was languages, and he could translate the Bible into all those Indian dialects. And people began to get saved, and as they got saved, then the culture was challenged, and then he partnered with other political officials and was able to abolish the practice of city in India. But up until just a little over 100 years ago, if you were married, and your husband died, you burnt with him. That's terrible. Now, you were raised, most of us, because we had some form of a Judeo-Christian outlook on life. Even it permeates our, even, even our ungodly culture, there is still influence of our Judeo-Christian Puritan uh, upbringing. Okay? And that's why that's so shocking to us. Another place, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, or different places in New Guinea. Man, if you're a missionary... In New Guinea, and they invite you over to dinner, that could mean something totally different. <laughs> that means they're going to invite you over for dinner. They're going to eat you for dinner. Because in New Guinea, there are still practicing tribes of cannibalism. This is real, okay? I think about the, 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 the um, uh, slave trade. I mean, for centuries... And even in some places, it still goes on today. Speaking of the Super Bowl, speaking of slavery, the number one sex trafficking place in the entire world is the Super Bowl. That is so disgusting. But for centuries, it was acceptable to take somebody's life from them while they're still living, but you take away their freedom and force them into labor, and force them to do things against their will, and not allow them to be free. When I visited the Ivory Coast, it was so sad. Plantations, what a rich and beautiful soil, what a rich and beautiful farmland, beautiful country, yet many, many children living in slavery that were kidnapped from eastern Africa and taken away from their families, and put to work in some of the corporations that produce goods and services that you and I use here in the United States. And, you know, how, how terrible. I don't understand how Nike is still in business. I mean, just, I don't understand. Using child labor, 20 cents a day, 30 cents a day, to produce those tennis shoes. Now, supposedly they've gotten away from that. But ladies and gentlemen, that is never, ever, ever acceptable. <laughs> Brother Mike Fox, a missionary friend of Andrew and I's, his induction into missions, his very first assignment was Costa Rica. <laughs> and he went to Costa Rica, and he was ministering, and they said, uh, we need somebody to go into the jungle and retrieve the body of the last missionary that got sent. And there was a missionary that went into this village and preaching, and, and they didn't like what he said, so they simply strapped him to a tree and killed him. 
And so Mike Fox's very first assignment was he went into the jungle and the body was still tied to the tree. And he untied the body and he carried it back to send it back. There are a lot of ungodly cultures around the world. Okay? So what's happening, we see happening in the United States, it's new to us, but it's not new to God, and it's not new to the world. Does that make sense to everybody? And I understand, and, 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 and when, we, when we see these things, we get so upset and moved and grieved, and we should be, we should be, uh, but because our culture was derived much of it from the Puritans and our early forefathers who did come with Judeo-Christian values, it did give us a godly heritage. And until really the mid-1900s, there was very little challenge to that. Now, as I say that, the caveat is, does that mean that we always made decisions righteously or we always did things appropriately as a nation that we should be proud of? Absolutely not. But as far as a culture goes, it somewhat reflected Judeo-Christian values. Now, that brings us to today. This is not your father's Oldsmobile. That used to be a marketing campaign for Oldsmobile. In 1960, teachers defined the top two problems in school as chewing gum and talking in class. When I talk to our teachers today, they would love it if those were the only two problems that they dealt with in their schools. Today, it's drugs, it's violence, it's broken homes, it's having parents that are incarcerated, it's severe poverty, it's gender identity crises, and we've had a downhill slide in our culture. My daughter called me very distraught this past Wednesday in Colorado. They go to college in Colorado, and, and this went before the Colorado legislature on, on Wednesday, and, and uh, they voted, and, and, and her whole college, I mean, hundreds of people from their college went to the state house there and protested, and they spoke before the, the Colorado State Congress, and they were overridden, and the state voted that at the age of fourth grade or nine-year-olds were going to be taught the LGBT agenda, that it is completely acceptable and it's okay to experiment and it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Furthermore, and, and a little PG-13 here, but furthermore, nine-year-olds, fourth graders, are going to be taught how to use things like prophylactics and not just mentioned but demonstrated, and they have to participate in the demonstration and, do, and, and perform it themselves. This is, this is fourth grade. This is Colorado. And my, my daughter, and she was, of course, if you know my daughter, she, she get, when she gets fired up, there's no, she's upset. <laughs> she let me know, what are we going to do? We got to stop this. Yes, dear. <laughs> what are you going to do, Dad? I'll call the president right now. We could go on and on. I think many people are aware of, of the, the law that was recently passed in New York and the law that almost passed in Virginia. And uh, so today, I think I've got time for basically two scriptures. I want to lay a found. That's the problem. That's the introduction. Let's talk about the solution. Let's talk about what God's perspective is. The first thing I want to tell you is this. It's Hebrews chapter 13 and 8. And if you've got your bulletins, the, the notes are in there. Scripture number one, Hebrews 13 and 8. Uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think we need to say that verse together. Say that with me. Say, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is, the is the same yesterday, yesterday today, today, and forever. And forever. Amen. He does not age because he is a spirit. Okay, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And if something was important to Jesus 2,000 years ago, it's important to him today. If something was important to him at the foundation of the world, it is still important for him today. He does not change. Okay? He will never change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you ever meet a Christian, 
And they say, and, and, and growing up kind of with the Pentecostal background, I did, and nothing against the Pentecostals, but we got a little bit goofy in the 70s and 80s. And, and sometimes these you know, folks would hear multiple revelations from God, you know, which is, yeah, God speaks and he absolutely does that, praise God. But sometimes people would have a revelation one day that would say this, and then the very next day they would say, well, no, God told me this, and the two conflicted each other. And so were you wrong yesterday or were you wrong today? Because if you listen to some people, you would think God is a schizophrenic. And God is not a schizophrenic. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his word will never pass away. He said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Jesus said not one dot or cross, well, he said jot or tittle. What we would say in the English is well, there wouldn't be one cross of a T, one dot of an I that will pass away out of the entirety of the word of God. Amen. Jesus Christ is the same. His character is the same. His personality is the same. His likes and dislikes are the same. Amen. That's who he is. Culture may change. Methods of the church may change. But the word of God never, never, never changes. So let's go to Malachi chapter 2. I know you all love the book of Malachi. If you've not been around the church very long or you're Italian, it's Malachi. That was a, seriously a revelation to me at one time that it was not Malachi, it was Malachi. But I don't think it really matters how you pronounce it. <sighs> and this is a word from God to the Old Testament counterpart of pastors, which was priests. I am a New Testament version although modified, new and improved, 2.0, of an Old Testament priest, okay? This is God's word to the Old Testament priests about their culture. And we're going to read the first nine verses of chapter 2. And now, O priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear and you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already, because you do not take it to heart. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuse on your faces. Now, that's my, that's my, my newer translation, but that's talk, if you have an older translation, it's saying I'm going to spread poo-poo on your face, you big disgrace. <laughs> Hallelujah. Moving on. The, the refuse of your solemn feasts, and one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him and one of life and peace, I, and I gave them to him that he might fear me. So he feared me, and he was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth, and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity. He turned many away from iniquity. From the lips of a priest should keep knowledge, and people should seek the law from his mouth. For he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, I have also made you contemptible and base before all the people, because you've not kept my ways, but have shown partiality in all your ways. So God, this is a rebuke, by the way. Now, I know sometimes society likes to paint God as a picture of an effeminate, just let's all get along, and, and there, there's, there's no might, and it's all just, you're such a good person, here's a trophy. That is not the picture of God that the Bible presents. God is a mighty and powerful, all-knowing, ever-present God. And there are times, and in our men's study even yesterday, we studied that God is, there are times he's a God of war. And when he comes back, it tells us there's going to be a bloodshed. And in this case, God is rebuking the priest. And he says, you know what? 
You're not like, you're, you're descended from Levi. Levi was the first priest. And he said, Levi used to tell the truth. He used to preach the word. He used to honor me. He used to turn people away from sin. You could go to Levi and he would have the word of God. But he says to these priests, you priests today, you don't confront anybody. With, you're not preaching the word. You're not taking the word and demanding that people live the word. You're compromising the word and telling people they can live however they want. You're not confronting the culture. That's what he's saying. And as a result, here's the deal, priests. He's going to send a curse upon you. He's going to curse your blessings. He's going to rebuke your descendants. How would you like your, to know that your children and grandchildren are cursed because you of something foolish that you did? Now, this is Old Testament, I realized. I'm going to spread manure on your faces. Where is that in, let's all get along, little snowflakes? I'm going to make you contemptible. In other words, you're going to be the despised of the world. Israel, and if you read the rest of the book of Malachi, God addresses their attitudes that the priest refused to. And here were some of the attitudes that God addressed in Malachi. You did not respect or bring respectable offerings in service. You did not give your best efforts for God. You married unbelievers. You have bad marriages. You've questioned God. You've ceased tithing. And you have a what's the use attitude. And in this text, God is confronting the priests because they tolerated that culture. They departed from the way in verse 8. They caused many to stumble in verse 8. They bent the word of God in verse 9. They twisted the word to fit popular opinion instead of preaching the truth in love. And today, God's will is for his priests to speak the truth in love. Whether or not culture agrees, we must know that God is going to hold people like me accountable for what was preached in our pulpits. And we must never deviate from the word of God. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive the stricter judgment. That is a New Testament principle. I, I would just share with you, and I actually, I, I took a series on Wednesday nights about six months ago, maybe seven or eight now. Time goes by fast. But in that series, I talked about with our social media um, phenomenon, that there are so many people uh, that just, who aren't, that they can get on and, and voice their opinions, which everybody has right to, right to an opinion, but there's a lot of people that are trying to come across as a five-fold office gift that are not. And it, even this past few months ago, I took a video of an on an online personality, got like 46 million hits on this. It was a rant. And all he did was talk about problems and how the church is bad and the church is this and the church is that. And we took what he said and we filtered it through the word of God. And we found out that he had absolutely no business saying anything. He was not called of God. He was not called of God. And he's going to be in trouble. When he stands before God. Now, if he wants to be a man of God, then be a man of God. But don't just sit up there and give just a little bit of scripture to make people, spiritual people interested, but then say whatever you want to say. We have to stay in the context of the word of God. And this morning, I realize I'm not preaching like I would normally preach. And, you know, I can excite you and move you and stir you and tell awesome stories and those type of things. Maybe, I, I think they're awesome. But today, I'm just setting up a foundation 
to come back here over the next few weeks and minister on Christ, culture, and the church. And the first thing I, I wanted to establish is, regardless of the culture, the church always takes our cues from Christ and his word. Amen. Right now, and I'll say this in closing, and for my closing, and then I'm going to turn the service over to Pastor Steve, and you're going to finish with the communion here. Um, I, I am broken for the unborn. But before New York passed the law, I was broken for the unborn. I hope you are too. And um, on the day of its birth, do you understand the evil? Pure, unadulterated, satanic hate. And what really, really, and, and just know how much discipline I'm using right now. I mean, I want to go off. But I will say, and I mean this, to call yourself a man or a woman of God and to make any defense whatsoever or to condone that type of legislation or in some cases, show up and bless an abortion clinic. I set that alarm on purpose. That tells me you got to run. <laughs> but to do and have any form of that kind of mentality, I would declare that is a false prophet, a false man of God, and they will burn forever in hell. They will burn in hellfire. They will burn in hellfire. And right now, there's a major denomination that, is, that can't figure out what the Word of God says. And they're deciding, you know, whether we're going... Now, they've already allowed clergy to be LGBT. And look, pastor, that's hate speech. No. We, listen, if you're LGBT, Welcome. I got seats right there. I got seats right there. I got seats. I got seats up in the back. You are come, welcome to this church. We will love you. We will put our arms around you. Sit with us. But my heart is that you're coming to seek what God says, not to get me to condone your lifestyle. Amen. I was preaching. Uh, I was a guest minister a few weeks ago, been a month and a half ago. And the Lord gave me a word, and I didn't know anybody. I just step up to the pulpit, and the first thing out of my mouth, they don't know me. I said, there's a word of God here. Here's the word. There, there's somebody here, and you, you think you're a homosexual. And you're struggling with that. You don't know, and I don't know you from Adam, but I just want you to know the Lord sent me today to tell you you are not a homosexual, that God did not create you that way, and you can be free. I didn't know this at the time, but there were two people sitting together. Both of them identified as homosexual. And one person got up offended. That's hate speech, and they walked right out and made a big scene. The other person came to that altar and repented, and they've sought counseling, and there, here they are. You know, they're, they're in that church, they're getting planted, and they, they, they said, you know what, that's right, God didn't create me that. How would they have known unless we told them the truth? Amen. Not everybody's going to receive the truth, and, and I'm not putting down LGBT people. No more, and, and same with, if you're in adultery, same thing, man. You're welcome to this church, but you need to repent. If you're in gossip, you're welcome to this church, but you need to repent. If you're a glutton, you're welcome to this church, but you need to repent. It's all of us. We need Jesus. 
but, but, the, but what we can't have is a gluttonous person saying, you know what? The word, that, the word I, I have no conviction for my sin because the Bible, is, the, the Bible has evolved. No, gluttony is a sin. Amen. Gossip is a sin. Now, aren't y'all glad we have forgiveness? And LGBT, they can get forgiveness. We can all get forgiveness. But it comes, we acknowledge our sin. And if you say you have no sin, you are a liar. So I'm not here today to preach against anybody. But I am here today to tell you, as I close, mainline denomination who've already ordained and have many clergy that are transgender. Uh, this is one of the oldest and most successful denominations in our nation. And they're getting ready to have another conference where they're going to try to decide what they believe. And i got to tell you, um, I'm already distanced myself from that denomination very substantially. But I would tell my pastor friends, and I would tell people in that church, even here in Cloverdale, if there is any type, of legislation that says is any way, shape, or form acceptable, get out now. And I know the pastors are looking at you saying, well, our pension is, you know, we have pen. Get out or burn. How dare you say that, Pastor? Why? I got to go. <laughs> but how dare you not let me say that? I just, I can't, that sounds so judgment. You want to talk about judgment? Depart from me. I never knew you. You will burn in hell. Oh, that's hellfire and brimstone preaching now, pastor. I'd rather hear it now. I'd rather hear it on this side of eternity. I'd rather hear it now. Let me save your soul. Pastor Steve, you better get up here. <laughs> maybe, maybe some love and grace. <laughs> Tell a joke. <laughs> hey, I'm headed to Brazil. Uh, I'm, I am two minutes away from literally having to do the OJ in the airport. So we're going to fly up there on I-70 in Jesus' name. No Rex. I love you. Uh, pray for us. I'll be back next Sunday, Mossbach this Wednesday. Andrew's going to come up, give you some announcements as soon as this is done, and you can go beat the Baptist to lose today, praise God. I'll see you later. Hi there, I'm Pastor Matt. I just want to take this moment and say thank you so much for tuning in to the ministry of Soul Harvest Church Online, and it's a privilege to minister to you each and every time. And I just want to invite you to be a living and active part of our vision to touch the world from West Central Indiana. And if you've been blessed by our ministry, I would ask you to very strongly consider sowing into our ministry to provide that our ministry would continue to go deeper and wider to impact people just like you all around this world that cost the precious blood of Jesus. So I would appreciate a gift of any amount. And, and I would ask if you're on YouTube, click the link below. If you're online on our website, click a, a Give Online. Or if you're on our app, hit the Give Online tab, and it'll take you through a couple easy steps, and you'd be able to sow. And we just pray God's richest blessing on you today. Thank you. God is good. His word is true. And it works in your life, friend.